Hello and welcome everyone to our next live talk session here from Prince for Wildlife Photographer Spotlight. My name is Marion and today I'm joined by the wonderful French wildlife photographer Elise Pertier, who is joining us from London, not from France. Uh, she will tell us a little bit about that <laughs> as well. Um, the, today's topic is all about how to create meaningful impact with creative work a topic that is very dear to Ellis because she's uh, been involved with various conservation organizations, has a strong background in conservation with community involvement that is very sustainable, very holistic. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that as well. And um, yeah, we'll hear all her stories from the African bush. She has been in uh, Liwande in Malawi, one of the African parks parks for a long period. So that's also really nice to hear a bit of these stories. Please, everyone, feel free to use the chat uh, on the right side that you can see to ask any questions to Alice. Uh, we will make sure to answer everything that's interesting to you. So welcome, Alice. Thank you so much for joining. <laughs> Thanks, Marion. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining as well. <laughs> We're so happy to have you. You've been one of our uh, winners of the open call last year. So uh, for those of you that don't know about uh, this concept of ours, for us, it's really important at Prince for Wildlife to have a diverse group of contributing photographers. So, you know, there are the big names, of course, there are the net geo photographers and like really acclaimed and established photographers. But for us, it's really important to also give room and opportunity to new voices. Ellis was one of the people that entered the open call last year and uh, she won with an incredible image of a, a elephant bull reaching up to a tree shot in uh, Zimbabwe, in Manapuls, if I'm not mistaken, right? One of the areas that Alice really loves. We will also touch that uh, a little later. So yeah, thank you again, Alice, for joining. And maybe to kick things off, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you even, like you're from France, I already said that. How did you get in touch with, uh, with Africa, with wildlife conservation, photography? How did that all come about? Thanks, Marion. Um, so I do have a few photos that I'll share, um, but I'll just, Actually, no, I'll bring them up now. Um, Always hmm. lovely to illustrate. <laughs> yes. Let's see. Um, okay, while well, it's loading. Um, oh, there we go. There we go. Good. So, yeah. Um, so, how did I fall in love with wildlife photography? Well, I fell in love with wildlife um, growing up. So I grew, I'm French, but I grew up in London. But um, in France, I'm from the countryside um, in the middle of nowhere in, in, in Burgundy. And um, growing up, we would always go back home for the holidays and just spend hours walking in the forest looking for wildlife. And I've just been really lucky to have had an upbringing that has connected me to nature in a way that has just been from the beginning. And then from photography, I've... I've been so passionate about just creating and storytelling. I just remember at school we had these um, show and tell days uh, and I just loved getting up there and just telling a story about my favorite plushy toy or whatever it was we were talking about. But I've, I've always had this desire to share and to um, just communicate stories. And then um, when I was 13, mum took us on a road trip with my brother in Namibia and I really fell in love there's no other way to put it uh it was it, it just it just hit me in the face the minute we got off the plane the heat the smells the colors um and it was it was it was dawn so it was just the most amazing thing to land into and um and then I was introduced to the Namibian conservation model which is I think Namibia is the one this is the first country to have integrated conservation in its constitution in 1997 and it was the first one to sort of start talking about holistic conservation in intertwining communities people landscape um, and I was hooked and I just realized that's what I wanted to do with my life um, so I studied a degree uh, called arts and sciences in London um, which is an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary degree where we created our own um, degree, picking from different faculties and different modules. And the only rule was that we had to pick both in the human sciences and in the sciences. And so I axed everything around conservation, especially the practice and the management of it. I was really interested in the big picture approach, um, but I did have my minor in conservation biology. And as I was studying, I realized there was a huge gap between 
what conservation is and how it's perceived by people um, in the Western world, um, in, in Africa. Um, basically, everyone has their own perception of conservation. And I was just really interested in bridging that gap because there are so many things that happen on the ground that just go off untold and unnoticed. And I thought that art is just such a beautiful way to start a conversation. And so, voila. Um, so here you can see in the photos, uh, there's some the, the, this elephant top here. Oh, I forgot to put the names. Um, Claire Obscure is, is a portrait from Zimbabwe. Down there, it's um, a photo of a of a beautiful project that, if we have time, I'll mention. Um, in a, a next to the Nilewandi National Park, started by a guide working there that I met. Um, a project called Entendere, which means uh, peace in Chichewa. Um, and then some photos from Lewandi up with the lion and then Virunga National Park down in the right. And there's something I'm really interested in photography. It's the balance of darkness and light. And it's something that I'm interested in general and that I've um, that I've brought to my work a lot. So, yeah, I um, that's how it all started. <laughs> yeah, that's lovely. Thank you so much, Alice. And I think, yeah, please take the time to talk about the projects that are dear to you and that you know you have experienced from uh, your own travels to to malawi and to africa in general i think it's really interesting to to hear these stories as you say it's not about the photography alone like there's always this extra level of storytelling that you pursue so prolifically so please do elaborate <laughs> so um the way i started getting involved with using my work um to raise awareness and to raise funds was um, in my second year of uni, we had to take an internship during the summer and I decided to do mine in Kenya on the, with Lewa Wildlife. Um, so for those who don't know, Lewa is a, is a quite a famous conservancy that's in Lakipia, which is in Northern Kenya, which is one of the most beautiful places in Kenya. Um, and it, um, it was a, a sort of conservation internship where we just got to see the behind the scenes of how a conservation organization like label runs and then we could give feedback it was kind of like a, a, a an internship where we'd we'd tell them how we would how we'd communicate this to the youth because they wanted lower had noticed that the majority of their supporters were quite um senior and from a certain background and they wanted to elaborate that so we were there to kind of help to see how we could bring it to younger the younger generation um and then we had to create a sort of project that would make it last so i decided to start um selling my photos for conservation create a fundraiser and then following that week in lewa i um so the the two photos from Lewa, Queen of Dawn and Ancient Power. Lewa is very, very famous for its rhinos. It holds around, I think, 17% of Kenya's rhinos through extensive, incredible conservation um, practice. And um, it's just become such a stronghold in the north for uh, black rhinos, white rhinos, and also in terms of bringing conservation to people. So the, the bond between communities in Lewa um, and the growing community conservancies that have been uh, born from the Lewa model are just, is just really inspiring and it's what I wrote my um, thesis on. I was looking at how successful um, this model was in terms of both supporting social and ecological aspects and I had to study many, many projects to see which ones were doing good and, and the Lewa kind of Ilinguisi Borana model was, was, was really quite a successful one in, in making sure that people benefited as much as the wildlife did. Um, and following that trip, I went to Virunga National Park in the Congo, um, much to my parents' displeasure, and spent a week there. And I wanted to go because I also wanted to look at how this example of community conservation was put into place. So how was a park that was historically a fortress park um, giving back to the communities? And it just inspired me so much because there's something really special about conservation in conflict areas in how um, natural resources are the last things that people care about. If anything, they are utilized to fuel and fund these conflicts. And just looking at the interaction between conflict community, insecurity, guerrilla conservation, elephant conservation, and just ecosystem conservation was really eye-opening. And that fuel fueled me to get involved a lot more and, and start being a lot more professional with my work. And so Progressively, I started investing a lot in my portfolio. So all these these three leopard photos um, are from a trip to Zambia that literally I couldn't afford, but I knew I had to do. Um, and it was that trip that really, uh, it, was in, it was two years after I went to the Congo. And that was kind of the moment where I could see that 
my portfolio was starting to become professional, it was something that I could pitch to organizations, to companies, so that they could then um, send me on assignments or collaborate with me and um, work with me. And I'll, I'll touch up on it later as to how to achieve this and how to get there. But it was, it was the, the really important thing for me was to find stories that I wanted to tell and find places that my gut was telling me to visit and then see how I could um, support projects there, see how I could um, grow my creative mind as well, because this was a few years ago. So I was in my early 20s and you, it's still a phase where you're growing a lot. And I, I look back on my portfolio from a few years ago and it's certainly not it's it's not as sharp as I, I would have liked it to be now, but it's certainly a part of the process. So there's always this space of needing to grow and grow and continue to create and create until you start clicking with your mind. So um, yeah, that's in a nutshell how I started going from um, sort of just casually taking photos to actually using them to raise awareness, to raise funds. When I sell a print, I donate 50% of the proceeds to projects that I've worked with or that are meaningful and that I really believe in. Um, and I really emphasize on the story that's around the project to raise awareness because I think that impact, and I'll get to that later, but impact isn't just funds, it's awareness, it's content, it's um, there's so much intangible things that you can achieve with your work that is so important. So, yeah. Oh my God, Alice, uh, there are so many questions in my mind already from everything that you've been saying so far. <laughs> One thing that stuck with me and I think would be really interesting to touch upon is you talked a little bit or a lot actually about how you think community involvement in conservation can be done differently and how it, you know, as opposed to like a fortress park, it can be done like Lewa with a more inclusive approach where people really not only benefit, but maybe also participate actually in conservation. So maybe just tell us a little bit from everything you've researched and all the projects you've visited, what really makes the difference? Can you even put that down in a few words or is it really yeah, no, in of course. intangible? Yeah, of course. Um, I think that the most important, from, from when I wrote my thesis, the most important thing that came out was that in order for community conservation project to work, there needed to be trust, capacity building and security. So the project that um, for, for the communities to trust that a project was going to give them something. It wasn't really about the project generating money or bursaries or whatever, because in fact, if you think about it, bursaries will only work with people who have children and a community, not everyone has children. And, you know, the elders or the, the, the youth, the women, the children, um, they're all different. Uh, communities are very, very hybrid. So it's, it's, there's no one size fits all. And actually what does bring a community together is the security that they're not, their land's not going to be taken. And in Kenya, for instance, the land belongs to the government unless there's a conservancy or it's, it's privately owned, but con communities living on land don't own the land. And so that was one of the biggest things in initiating the creation of conservancies. Um, and of course, this varies. There's no one size fits all across um, conservation. But um, the, the importance of listening is, I think for me, sitting under a mango tree, because it's the shadiest tree in the village, <laughs> listening, to the, listening to what the needs are, what the stories are, you know, human wildlife conflict is very real. It's very difficult for us to understand because we don't live in areas where we have to deal with it. But when an elephant raids your crops, when a lion kills your uncle, when, um, or your cows, when, when you have 10 children to feed the wild, it's not something romantic. It's very much hostile. So it's important to listen to these stories because communication is, I think communication is the single most important tool for community conservation, for conservation in general. And too long did we have fortress conservation practices, which was just putting a fence around a, a park and saying, right, people aren't allowed to go there. We use it for recreation as tourists, as hunters, um, but people being in the park is damaging the park. And this was the colonial narrative and the reason why many people were um, rehomed. Um, but it's not proven effective because obviously when you kick someone out of their home, they're not going to take it very kindly and they'll retaliate with conflict often. So there's this, and then there's also the very blurred narratives. If you look in Central Africa, in, this, in Central Africa, let's look at the Central African Republic, for instance, you've got, um, hunter gatherers who've been hunting in areas for millennia, well, centuries. Suddenly a park is created because it's a natural resource and these natural resources are disappearing. So we need to protect these resources. 
the rules of the park say that you're not allowed to consume the wildlife. So a hunter-gatherer goes in. Of course, they're not even aware of this. It's not like someone comes and tells them. Some, there might be a fence that's put up, but there's very little communication about it. They go in, hunt a diker, come out. They're considered a poacher. So it's very important to understand the different scales of poaching or hunting and to look at, to understand poaching in a kind of criminal, criminally organized um, uh, situation where there's a desire to traffic. So it's very blurred, but it's, this, is where it, this is where I find it interesting. And this is why I wanted to get involved, is to see that there are so many different narratives. There's so many fine prints that no one talks about because, because it's too easy to put up a photo of a polar bear and say, donate three pounds to adopt a polar bear to protect polar bears. But conservation isn't just saving animals. It's actually protecting ecosystems and protecting the people that live on the ecosystem. And it's, for me, it's a philosophy. It's something that we should all be practicing here and in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, it's our relationship with the ecosystem. So the community conserva conservation um, uh, kind of way of doing it and practice has just made me think a lot about how we can bring this into our own lives as well. And how, if we're asking this of people who live in Africa, who deal with conflict on a day-to-day -day basis, or who deal with um, very finite resources, how can we apply the same practices as well in our day-to-day -day lives? So mm -hmm. just things to think about. <laughs> very interesting. Um, I think if we talk about all this approach about community-driven uh, conservation, then it ties really nicely into what Prince for Wildlife is all about. We learned that working together with African parks, how intertwined these topics are. And in the end, we're selling, you know, incredible, stunning images of wildlife, which is, if we're talking about how to create impact with, you know, with creative work, we're always discussing that topic. Like, shouldn't we also show the people? Because they are key. They are at the core, at the heart of the solution. But then it doesn't sell well, right? And in the end, you know, we are raising funds and it's a bit of like a commercial undertaking, of course, like for a very good uh, cause, but we are here to make uh, an, a successful print sale. And uh, that's something I've also discussed with African parks. Like they always show a lot about the, the wildlife side of their impact, but not a lot about the community side. And how could you better communicate that? And looking at your work now, it's, it's the same example, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> why? But I do like have, that? I do have, I do have people photos coming right up. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so basically, um, the thing is, when you work, and I, I've worked for a while with an organization called Chinguetta Wildlife, and they specialize in training rangers. Um, protect, um, empowering communities, but actually empowering communities, not just saying, oh, we empower communities, and of course, protecting wildlife. Um, and I had to work a lot with the community uh, fundraising projects. And it is so difficult to fundraise when you're not talking about animals, because mm -hmm. the narrative that is, it's so easy to sponsor a cute, fluffy animal, you know, a baby elephant with its cute ears and its trunk that it doesn't know how to use yet and or, or or a lion cub it just speaks to people because it's cute and I think there has been so many narratives of guilt and hate against people um in the last decade because of climate change because of environmental degradation because of war because of that we don't really it, it's it's a lot harder to connect to people weirdly enough despite it being our own species um because there's a I think there's a bit of a rejection of people and it's part of the reasons why I so one of the ways I funded all of this because I certainly you you do need to fund trips to Africa in camera <laughs> gear is that I teach um, philosophy and literature I work with teenagers mostly um, but I'm starting to work with adults and what I found is and what it's it's helped me just see how beautiful and remember how beautiful culture is and how amazing our civilizations can be and were and the beauty that came out of it. And I think it's very, very important to reconnect the culture, the cultural and the natural, and to not kind of push that away. So I think that there's a part of, of this, that the fact that you know we, we don't feel like people need our help as much as wildlife also, perhaps because wildlife is, feels like it, it's, it's voiceless. So I think there's that. Um, but I, I think that it's very important to, and it, initially I thought like that as well. I wasn't interested in photographing people. This only came very, very recently which is you'll see in the next few slides, um, because suddenly I love documenting the project in its entirety. I love documenting the connection between people and, and the ecosystem and and the, the connect the whatever project was ongoing and how people related to it. Like 
suddenly I started seeing the stories there that deserve to be for me that that I should document but it, it took me a while because I just I just wasn't interested in, in photographing people um but I think that to achieve tangible meaningful impact with your work which is really something I'm super passionate about there's a few things that that need to be understood and it might not be the most obvious things so the first thing is that when we looked at impact there's many different ways there's financial which is a donation or you know help funding the project and then there's everything else the awareness um the stories the content um anything that is kind of intangible but that is huge for organizations and projects trying to make a name for themselves so it doesn't mean just necessarily donating print or like donating money but it can be reaching out to organizations that we love and researching them and saying hey how can i help this is my portfolio but in order to do that we need to have invested on in our own work for a while so we need to basically reach a stage where we're in a position to support an organization and not really hinder an organization by sending them something that might not be useful to them. Because often, yes, people need help, but they often want skilled help or they often want um, professional help. Mm -hmm. And so to reach these levels, there's a, there's a lot of things that can be done to kind of enhance the work. Obviously, enhance the creative work. That's something that's quite personal to all of us, I think, investing in courses and, and investing in in and different things to grow as, as a creative is important. But we need to grow as, as, a, as a person as well. And for me, there's four very important tools that we're going to need to be able to push this and to kind of bring this impact into the world and to back ourselves. And that's passion. Um, we're not always going to have, maybe not everyone is passionate. Maybe you're just very interested. But I think if we're going to pursue something as a creative or as someone who wants to create impact, I definitely think that passion is needed because the fire is important when it's difficult sometimes. We need knowledge. Um, there's a quote that I found recently that says, in this world today, there's too much information, too little knowledge and not enough wisdom. And I found that that was very true. We read one Instagram infographic and we think that we know everything about a situation. In order to help, or in order to drive you know, whatever effort you want towards a cause, it's so important to know and understand what's going on, the different perspectives, the, the situations, the history, the context, the research part is so important. And if you go to an organization and say, you know, I love what you do. I think that these values align with what I support and, and with my vision. And I love that this and this and this, and I've heard that this and is it possible? Like just show that you've done your research and that you're interested because that's going to stand out from anyone who just says, Oh, Hey, check my portfolio, I can help you. Um, so the knowledge is really important and it's something that is we, we're always gonna need. We need to keep learning, 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 even criticizing our ideas. I so often wake up and think, do I still agree with this? Is my idea, is my, is my philosophy, can it be criticized? And it should be, but can my arguments hold? Um, because you've got to inspire with, with what you're saying and you've got to know where you lie and, and back yourself. The third thing is determination. Um, you've got to want it. If you want to work as a conservation photographer or someone in the conservation world, it's gonna, it is difficult because there's so many photographers. It's a very saturated market. Um, there's many conservation organizations and often they're all looking for scientists um, or for very qualified people, which is difficult because when you've just graduated from university, they're not gonna go to you. They're gonna go for the person who has like 15 years experience. Um, so it involves being very determined, um, sometimes being very willing to do things just if it's for conservation, I often don't mind doing things for free, at least for now, because I think that resources should be focused on the project. And I find that the experience of being able to work alongside something like this is incredibly, incredibly enriching. Obviously, if it's something that is going to be something professional down the line, yes. But if, if you're at a stage where you're quite young and willing to experience, then I think that conservation just doesn't have the funds to 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 to, fi to finance a lot of this so i think it's worth just being determined and and going out there because sometimes the passion is going to dry up and sometimes it's going to feel very difficult because people around you i mean around me in in my life here with i look at the people growing up they weren't 
they weren't really interested in what I was doing and, and everyone was saying, oh, when are you not going to be on holiday? <laughs> I really wasn't on holiday when I was going out into the bush. Mm-hmm. But that's what it feels like. And so sometimes it can be difficult when the people around you don't understand and don't support. So you've got to know what you want and just go for it. And the last thing, and that's probably one of the most important things, is the network. Surround yourself with people who will uplift you, who will encourage you, who will criticize you when you ask for it with honest criticism, who will, you know, who will connect you to people. Like there is honestly, the reason I've been able to achieve all of this is mainly because I've networked and I've gone out there and spent all my savings on meeting people that I knew I, I needed to meet because they could maybe help me. And sometimes you hit wrong, sometimes you hit the mark, but the network for me has just been, even now when I have doubts or, or I'm not sure, just being surrounded by mentors or by people who I know I can trust is just incredible because we, it's not something that should be done alone. And I think that uplifting one another is such a powerful thing. And, you know, that's part of the, the, the tangible impact as well. We've got small wins along the way and being able to uplift one another and giving back to people and helping people out who we know we can help. Um, you know, if it's someone who wants to do the same thing, like, like right now, um, giving all the information and just making sure that it happens. I think that's, that's really important. Um, and I think the network is probably one of the main, the most important things that you can, you can have. Um, now that's kind of like the tools that I, I've looked at in terms of how I, um, how I like to function. But for me, the kind of base that, like the, the, the toolbox that encompasses all these tools, for me, the most important thing is self-awareness. It's so important to know yourself. And I mean, in the deep way to explore the, the, the shadows, the fears, the doubts, um, to resolve the traumas, to resolve the pain, to, to put yourself out there and, and look inside. Because I think it's very difficult to change the world if you're not in a secure, comfortable, confident, loving place. And I say this because all of self-awareness, um, you've got to know what drives you. You've got to know that you've got to want to grow. That's the knowledge. You've got to need to back yourself when you're determined. You've got to put out yourself out there and be honest and authentic to build your network because people will support you. If they see who you are and if you, know, if you come from a place of love and kindness and compassion and confidence, it will show and it's inspiring. And I think that for me, there's nothing better than to inspire people because the greatest thing that you can do is to make people think. And if you're in a position where you've done this, you look at all the people who've, who've inspired us, they're all kind, loving, compassionate people, and they give back. And I think that this shows truly in the way you approach people, in the way that you create your work um, and your creativity. I think that there's nothing greater than being very self-aware and, and exploring this. You know, my, my creative journey shifted immensely the minute I started looking inside. And the minute I started aligning with who I was and what I wanted to do and what I wanted to say, suddenly it was just an explosion in my mind in terms of what I wanted to create. And it might sound a bit wishy-washy to some, but I can tell you that every time I've had to deal with people who were manipulative or um, just abused their position of power or authority, it's because they're insecure. And I think coming to, especially in this industry, which is filled with egos, there's nothing better than being able to back yourself and be come from a secure place and be extremely confident and, and self-aware. And it's hard, like it's very hard. I don't, I'm not confident every day, but sufficiently so that, or at least I'm surrounded by a network when I do have doubts that can help me. So it's all these things that fuel themselves that kind of create this power package. But when you go out there and show work and show that you've invested in your work, that you've invested time in the field, you've put everything you have into this, into this. you've researched, you, you know what you want to do, you know what you've got to say, and you find people who are going to give you that voice. I think that, that for me, that's the most incredible way to achieve a meaningful impact because it shines and it shows. Um, and, yeah, and we have been blessed with like a huge group of photographers donating their work, you being among them, coming from this place of, you know, compassion, love, passion for their work, for conservation, for wildlife. And uh, I think it shows in the Prince for Wildlife um, editions as well. It's just a collection of outstanding, incredible work where we know that, you know, you guys put your heart and soul into this. You work tirelessly for years and years. Like you said, you know, you build your portfolio, you do 
free work in the beginning. You, you know, you don't charge because you just love what you do. And then you sit in some apartment on the floor where you're like, I don't have a home. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's worth it. <laughs> so uh, I think that's also what makes it so, such an incredible community because I think people can sense how much love goes into into these photos and into these editions. And uh, I think tying into that, it would be lovely if you show a little bit of your time in Liwande and um, how you experience the work that African Park uh, Parks is doing on the ground. Um, just a little um, side note, Silke, I saw your questions about uh, the funds and where they're going. We'll touch that uh, after Alice is uh, talking a little bit about uh, Malawi. Okay, cool. Um, so last year was a very, very, very difficult year for me. And power of network. I sent a message to someone I knew in Malawi saying, are you still looking for a photographer? She said yes. And a week later, I was shipped off to Liwandi. And um, I didn't know for how long. I didn't know what. I'd been living out of my bag for eight months. So I was, I just had no plan. And I was working for um, Central African Wilderness Safaris as their kind of resident photographer and just doing all their marketing and stuff. And it was just such a wonderful opportunity to live in Lewandi, which was a place that I absolutely loved, that I'd had the chance to visit um, three years prior because um, part of my gut feelings had been to go to Malawi for some reason. And that's how I ended up meeting Pam and things happened. So cherish your network. Mm -hmm. um, but it was it was the thing with with Lewandi is that it's the thing with Malawi actually was that it was a super super um, game rich area and it slowly lost a lot of its animals due to poaching and Lewandi had elephants had it just didn't have predators and so it has a, a, a kind of lushness in terms of the just the sheer numbers of. <laughs> wildlife that you see, kudu, waterbuck, um, impala, there's just everywhere. I've never seen, it's just super game dense. Um, and cause or Central African Wilderness Safaris had helped reintroduce black rhinos, I think about, uh, in, in, I think, oh, I'm not sure, a decade ago. Um, and then African parks, um, when did African parks go in? I think in 2015. 2015, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they reintroduced cheetahs, um, in 2016, which was kind of like a soft, gentle way to reintroduce predators to see how the game would react because they hadn't seen any predators in quite a long time. Um, the cheetahs thrived. I was lucky. This bottom photo, New Beginnings, was uh, I was lucky to see them it, plenty of times in uh, 2019 when I went in the emerald season. So the grass was this high, but we saw just incredible cheetah sighting. Um, and then when I went back, uh, by then, lions had been re reintroduced. Wild dogs were about to be reintroduced, and they've just they've they were released. I think uh, a few months ago, and you know the population is just thriving. Um, I've never seen so many sable antelope in my in my life. In the dry season, you have hordes of sable that congregate on the floodplain that go drink, uh, hundreds of them. It's it's just such an incredible sight. And Malawi, I mean, Lewandi is such a beautiful park. You've got floodplain. You've got beautiful Mapani forest. Um, it just, it's, you've got baobabs everywhere, um, palm trees. It is such a lush, alive, beautiful environment. And it has the advantage of having very little tourists because, and I don't know why I'm saying this because I'd love it to be kept a secret, but it's, it's very off the beaten track and it's such a stunning place. So the work African Parks has been doing is, is in terms of just the reintroducing wildlife has just been absolutely amazing and it's now become a stronghold for repopulating Malawi with in other places um we'll talk about the translocation Marion and so it was nice to also be affiliated with the conservation projects that were going on because that's what I'm really interested in um as much as the wildlife of course and um Central African Wilderness Safaris work with different organizations that they've actually created namely Children in the Wilderness um which is this was a children in the wilderness project and um, another one called Rich Fruit that I haven't documented. And children in the wilderness um, collaborated with AP uh, for in one of the schools that um, children in the wilderness fund. And so I was lucky to just go and document a project. So they, um, CITW had this um, changing the lens on conservation project where they 
with their funds they donated or they didn't donate they they lent cameras to teachers um in different schools around the park uh around the park i think there was four schools and it was to help chil- children and teachers um share their own stories of nature and so it was about learning photography it was about learning how to write about nature and i just thought it was such a beautiful project very close to my heart and um it was great to see african parks were involved as well because too few conservation organizations collaborate together that is something that i just do not understand but it is a stark reality and it was very nice to have you know um in i can't remember the name of the school i can't remember um but it was nice to have the, the ap join for a bit and and the, the kids had to write a story called it was Nat Geo. It was a Nat Geo <laughs> workshop and they had to write an essay about a, an experience with nature. A lot of them talked about human wildlife conflict. A lot of them talk, talked about elephants, um, but some talked about the beauty of nature. Some talked about soil erosion. And the whole point of this was to change the perspectives around conservation and around wildlife. And I just thought it was beautiful. So the, the park um, warden here was telling them about conservation and kind of giving them feedback on their stories which I found great um and then the two photos here these are the AP rangers that were working at uh, Mvu Lodge and they were always out so it was also nice to just sit down and chat with them and ask them and you know about their their life as a ranger as an African parks ranger and it's true that a lot of rangers aren't really well looked after because of funds so that's one thing AP does is that it it funds it, it looks after they look after their rangers you know they've got good boots, good equipment, good comfortable uniforms. And it's sadly really not a reality that you'll find often in the field. So um, let yeah. me just jump in, in there, Alice, because I think this is the perfect moment to answer Silke's uh, question. So Silke has been asking if we have plans to uh, show where the funds went after the campaign and also in preparation now of the new edition. So where have they been used? What has been supported? And I think I can explain to you a little bit like the general concept of uh, fundraising, which I only learned through Prince of Wildlife. So there's two types of funds. There's the so-called restricted and unrestricted funds. Restricted funds means a donor goes to African parks and says, okay, I want to support the elephant translocation, for example, that is now happening in, in Liwande in Malawi. Um, and this is where my money has to go. So that's restricted funding. And then there's unrestricted funding, which is what Prince for Wildlife does. So everything that we donate to African parks is unrestricted. We don't tie it to a special cause. And this is what they call gold. Because exactly what Alice is explaining, raising funds for things like boots, for rangers, tents, basic equipment, this is the hardest stuff to raise funds for because it's not sexy, it's not cute, it's not lovely, like it's not something you can put in a nice Instagram post. And uh, that's the downside of it is we cannot show directly where each of the dollars that you are funding for goes to because it is this kind of unrestricted money, which makes it a bit hard for us communication wise to say, okay, the hundred dollars you bought this print for went to funding a pair of boots in, in Malawi because it is unrestricted. But please know 100% of these proceeds, we are always saying that after we deduct uh, the printing costs, goes directly to work on the ground. So it's not going to overhead, it's not going to you know marketing, Facebook ads, you name it, these things that are also necessary, but even less sexy. Uh, it goes to work on the ground, but we cannot directly say where it goes to. So I hope this answers the questions a little bit. Why? Why we can only, we always, you know, the things we communicate is where we support, like what kind of efforts we support it. One thing, for example, would be in Malawi that over 6,000 school children, the people that Alice just showed in the photos, have been brought to the park to also see what's happening in Liwande, which is so important. And we saw that we just uh, visited uh, Akagera in Rwanda and we joined one of those school kids groups in the in a bus the first time seeing some other wildlife things that they don't see you know in their communities outside some hippos some sable antelopes maybe not in Akagera but <laughs> in Malawi that would be yes. and the you know the engagement and the excitement that these kids have this will create impact and would, will tie them emotionally to supporting these conservation areas and that's just incredible to, to see. 
Um, so yeah, Silke, thank you for, for that question. Uh, what do you say? Thank you for explaining. Making it more visible, yeah, yeah. I think this is something we have to, and that's one of the goals for this year. That's why we're hosting these talks. That's why we're telling more stories behind the prints to make it more tangible what goes into these incredible wildlife photos. Um, Ellis, sorry, back to you. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, no, I just wanted to just talk a little bit, like very briefly about how beautiful Lewandi is. It honestly, it is one of the most unique places I've ever visited in Africa. I think that there's just such a diversity in the landscapes um, and the light. I mean, you have you, the African light is beautiful, but because there's the Shiri River, um, because there's just so many, so many trees and it just kind of filters through, it's beautiful. And it's beautiful to visit every time of year. I was there in the Emerald season in April um, 2019 and it was stunning. It's when this um, kudu photo was taken. And then when I was working there, it was at the height of the dry season. Um, and so you can see the floodplain is really dry. And, but then there was so many sable. You can see all the animals at the back. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. And I mean, Mvu had, has resident cheetahs it has now resident lions where lions come in the camp um and it's it's just it's just a, a little slice of paradise and it's a place that feels like home now um because of the wonderful people i got to work with and that i met who really took me in like their daughter and i just i couldn't be more grateful than for the three months that i spend there because there's nothing like the bush to kind of help you reconnect with 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 what's true and what's real and and it's something that I needed at least and I I really think that if if people want to join if they want to go somewhere that's wild off the beaten track far from tourists Malawi has so much to offer and it's something that I'm really passionate into communicating and bringing and that I, I'd actually I'm very keen to do um conservation driven safaris as well so we'll uh, we'll talk about it but yeah that's yes. the special uh <laughs> let's let's do one thing in between i think it's uh and up next it yes <laughs> this is revealing the print that you have donated for this year's edition to prince for wildlife um called dust patrol incredible incredible image please take us a little bit behind the scenes of that story how you captured that and where where is it what Thank happened you. <laughs> so this is in Lewandi. it's um to the south of the park i should have put a map i'm just i, I, was, I hate doing powerpoints as i was telling you <laughs> the french are terrible with powerpoints it's just scarred me for life with the <laughs> amount of powerpoints that i've indigested um but this is in the south of the park it's um one of the floodplains and you can see there's the hill at the back here which is just is so iconic of malawi and then all these palms and Malawi has so many elephants that are currently being, some of them are being translocated because there's a little too many elephants. And we were actually out on a staff drive and um, the car was full to the brim. <laughs> and we were looking at a pride of lions. There was this incredible pride that must have probably changed a bit now. But when I was there back in, um, this was in November, December, um, there was a pride of 11 lions and 11, 13, 13 lions. And we were just, watching them play and suddenly a small herd of elephants just crossed behind and it was just beautiful the sun was was there's still that quite like a yellow bright light just as the the kind of brightness of the day starts to fade and it was just such a serene moment to see the lions just the cubs kind of looking at the the elephants the mum was just glancing at them really not caring and then those little elephants just trumpeted past and it was a very peaceful moment and I, I this photo takes me back big time so i'm really glad that um it's the one that's been chosen for prince for wildlife lovely i think all of us would love to be there right now like please <laughs> <laughs> beam us down there <laughs> um yeah you you already said it uh, there's so many elephants right now in liwande that they've created such a stronghold that they're not now populating other parks in malawi from that population so Right now, one of the largest translocations ever has been undertaken, bringing uh, 250 of those elephants from Liwande to Kasungu Park in Malawi. It's a huge, huge project. Um, Alice, you said already African Parks is uh, luckily also collaborating with other organizations. So it's done in collaboration with IFO and also with DNPW from um, so Malawi's National Park Organization. 
And uh, we will have a live chat with Marcus Westberg, uh, who is part of our board, Prince for Wildlife board, which uh, we are really thankful for. And he's Such just, <laughs> he is a legend and he's just returned from uh, Malawi. He has covered the translocation. So make sure to sign up for that live talk as well to hear more stories. You know, maybe this family of elephants is now already in Kasungu. Who knows? <laughs> Um, yeah, and uh, Alice, next up, let's talk uh, lastly about your newest endeavor called Odyssea. This is uh, um, your company, safari company and storytelling studio that you're doing uh, together with Andrew. Uh, tell us what's happening there. <laughs> Other than bringing people to Malawi, <laughs> hopefully. Yes, it is in the works. So Odyssea is, is, our, is our passion project. Um, it, it's the Greek word for Odyssey. And, you know, very much in line with what I was saying earlier about how beautiful I find um, our culture, really, the cultural roots and, and the incredible things that humans have been able to create. We wanted to create something that celebrated both people in nature. And the Odyssey is a text, is a song, actually, that is um, one of the foundational pieces of Western literature. And it's funny because when you read it, you see that nothing has changed in 3,000 years and that the struggles that poor Odysseus had we have the same ones so human nature doesn't change and we just it's a story of homecoming of trying to find purpose and coming back to hope while well, coming back home and um you know the greek word for home ancient greek word for home is oikos and it gave words it gave the the prefix eco so the words like ecology economy ecosystem these are all related to the home and i think that there's just we just loved the the story behind trying to desperately to come home and and we really believe that we're at home in nature but also there's a disconnection between humans and nature and between humans and humans i think we're very disconnected from ourselves and it's what i mentioned earlier about self-awareness it's such an important thing for happiness and for joy and i think we wanted to create trips and bring people on trips that helped that help remind of this you know we want people to reconnect with nature but we think that it's such a powerful way to then reconnect with yourself and once you're reconnected with yourself you're a very happy person that doesn't need much um so it's 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 a mix from there and, and we're really keen to bring things back to basics so focus on creativity but also focus on um authentic adventures on like we, we andrew's a trails guide so we really would we're working on um bringing trails uh, as a safari and we want to go to places that are just beautiful and that are far from tourists i mean obviously wherever people want to go we'll take them but in terms of the trips that we create um the group trips the schedule trips um we're very passionate to go exploring and to go to doing things slightly differently and just brings bring thing back bring things back to simplicity and just appreciate the beauty of the world so we're a safari company we create content we teach as well um andrew's just released an amazing um photography course that is just the most beautiful thing ever and we're gonna we have a platform for online learning so we're gonna be filling it with more courses in terms of storytelling and uh, you know achieving impact with creative work something i'm very passionate about so it's all in the works and it's uh it's yeah if you want to go on safari just let me know <laughs> <laughs> that sums it up perfectly. Um, Alice, thank you so much. We do have a few questions uh, from the audience, which cool. uh, would be lovely to also answer. Uh, one came from uh, Elizabeth, who was asking if you ever encountered resistance or lack of respect for being a woman. She has um, observed that there appears to be a strong male network in conservation photography, which is something that I can only underline. It's unfortunately true. So how do you feel about that? So I've certainly felt resistance, um, but it wasn't because I was a woman. I, I, in fact, actually, no, I have felt resistance within the world of conservation. So I was meant to, a few years ago, I was meant, when I was meant to work for, um, I was meant to work for Lewa and I was meant to do certain things. And I just, I just realized that the hands, everything was okay. And actually someone who decided against was a woman. And I found that actually, whenever I found resistance somewhere, it often comes from another woman. And I think that that is a reality that is shared by other women that we've, we've, we've discussed. And I think that's, that's probably something that I find that I'm very passionate in changing because I think we should be uplifting one another. And 
um, the only time I've ever found a resistance from a man in photography, I don't think it was because I was a woman. I think it was just an abuse of power that, you know, I'm still, I'm not an established photographer yet. So it's quite easy to, to um, pick on someone like me, I suppose, except that I'm, <laughs> I really don't take bullshit. So, um, you know, it's, it's not as, it doesn't have a big impact on me. And that's what mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. about confidence and self-awareness. Like, if you're in a, it, it does happen, you know, it, it, it will happen. There's going to be so many egos that to be encountered um, in this industry. And I think that the most important thing is to just, you know, be very loving, be very forgiving and just move on. <laughs> and, but also talk about it. Um, I think being silenced isn't, being silent about these things is not a solution. Um, the thing is, it's very difficult to talk about these things when it's people who are in a position of power, because obviously it doesn't, uh, how how do you want to 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 take someone down who's in a position of power and who abuses it? It's mm. it's not so. It does require having a very strong um, support group, and I think finding very smart ways to do it um, in a in a way that's not you know aggressive or kind of manipulative or anything. I think yeah, mm. but I, I it's not happened to me. I, I've never felt um, belittled because I was a woman. Though. I have to say, like, I have made some um, experience when I was traveling together with my husband that when he, you know, I'm a photographer, he's not. So when he carries my photo gear, for example, everyone would always ask him, like, oh, what's that camera? What are you using? And if I then get to answer because it's my camera and I'm the photographer, people would still turn to him and would like to get his opinion. What you know what they would he would recommend as a camera so i think these subtle things are still happening and that's something as you said you have we have to be aware about and i think with print to wildlife for us it's like in our mission to empower more people to get access visibility awareness and this is targeted towards minority groups which unfortunately women are in conservation photography we're still the minority from a visibility standpoint not because there's less women doing it but because they get less visibility and that's why we host these open calls and we try to you know bring people like you on the forefront being there being you know shown <laughs> and displayed and showcased so that there is more awareness and and visibility for for women um another question came from adam who is a it seems he's a young wildlife photographer himself so he was asking for advice with uh, someone like him he's 18 years old and has little funding so what to do if you don't have money, basically? <laughs> okay, well, that's how I started. <laughs> um, Adam, I feel for you. Um, I had two jobs that I uh, worked. Uh, so I was teaching. I, I try to find jobs that... I, so three things. I decided to live at home. So I still kind of live at home so that I, I could minimize my expenses. Obviously, that's not a possibility for everyone. But, you know, limiting your expenses, I think, whenever you can is such an important thing. So it also meant sacrificing my social life. So I kind of went through uni with very limited social life um, because I all my savings would go into my travel and my camera equipment. And I um, made sure I yeah, I worked. Uh, I taught uh, tuition is one of the things that I found was a really good source of income and I mean it, it's not for everyone but I do find that when you do it right you can then start asking prices when people start recognizing and 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 it actually was a really 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 important way to fund everything and it's something that I still do today for pocket money because it's important um and yeah I'm hustling I, I think it's it's there's no easy way to go about it the other thing that I haven't tried that I think I should have tried is also to to you there's I think there's a lot of youth um, there's like bursaries, that, photographic bursaries or creative bursaries that you can apply for. Um, so again, this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about um, determination and and network. Where if that is, if you, there are ways, I know this this photographer who's now really established with Canon. She won, a, she got some funding for a project, and that that kicked it off a photographic project, and that kicked it off. I also know people who've um, entered competitions, photographic competitions, and made quite a lot amount of money from from winning. Um, so all these things definitely help. I hope that I think, helps. <laughs> I think that should help. That sounds like it makes a lot of sense. I think it was the same for most of us. Like when I uh, started photography, I did it next to my job. I 
did it on the weekends in in the evenings i had to still make a living from my regular job and then it was a slow transition for me so at some point i reduced my regular job hours to more reduced like 15 hours a week and then at some point i could eventually switch completely so it's it's a journey and it never ends like you said right Right. you look at your work from a few years back and you're like oh my god what was i thinking (laughs) (laughs) i have evolved a little bit (laughs) Um, i'm not the only one who feels that (laughs) no no it's the same for all of us (laughs) um it was lovely chatting to you i mean listening to you basically because uh everything all your stories are incredible comes from a place of love it comes from your heart you can feel that um it does connect everyone, hopefully, to your work, to Prince of Wildlife as well. We are looking forward to, to having you in, in the next edition, which we are about to launch relatively soon. We will uh, tell you the launch date ASAP on, on Instagram, on our newsletter. So please do stay tuned. Alice, if you have any final words you want to say, now would be the time. <laughs> Um, no, just just a big thank you, Marion, and a thank you to Principal Wildlife for organizing this because I think it's so important to connect, to just grow, collaborate as photographers and creatives and to support a cause. Um, I really, really believe in the power of working together and something like this is a great example. Um, and to everyone for joining, thank you. Uh, If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I literally, as you can see, love talking about these things, so I can talk endlessly about them. But if you feel like there's any way that I can help with networking or with, um, you know, just any kind of even reviewing images or or reviewing pictures or whatever, feel free. I love doing this. I I really have enjoyed working with um, teenagers and young adults in coaching them. So if it's something you want, let me know. I can happily do it. And um, yeah. Thank you. (laughs) Wonderful. Thank you so much for for offering. Thank you for your time, Alice. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's uh, live session. Um, There will be more. So tomorrow we are hosting Marcel van Osten, Dutch wildlife photographer, who will talk about his creative uh, thought process and previous residents. (laughs) pre-visualization, <laughs> complicated word, which uh, I think is very interesting also to, to hear what his thoughts are about that. So that is tomorrow. All the other live talks you'll find on the Prince for Wildlife uh, website. Thank you for joining. Have a wonderful evening or day wherever you are and uh, all the best to you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>